Hi, everybody. Welcome to week five of mini med school. We're going to get started at seven o'clock. So take that last bio break, get yourself a drink, settle in. We've got a great presentation tonight. I, I kind of peeked at some of it. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see you in a few minutes. All right, everybody, I have seven o'clock, so let's get started. Um, welcome, as I said, to week five. As always, a link for attendance will be put into the chat as soon as our speaker starts speaking. Um, if you miss it, then it, I promise we'll put it in again. Um, that survey must be filled out by nine o'clock tonight to get credit for attending tonight's presentation. This is, as I said, week five. We are going to have a fantastic talk about neurointerventional inter surgery. And I'm going to turn it over to Tim to introduce our speaker tonight. All righty. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, for those of you who have gotten used to getting an email announcing this evening's session, we had a little snafu on our end. My apologies for that. Uh, so this evening's speaker is uh, Dr. Sivapatham. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Pennsylvania and earned his medical degree from the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. He completed a residency in diagnostic radiology at the Ohio State University Medical Center, followed by fellowship training in neuroradiology at the University of Pennsylvania. He went on to complete two additional, uh, an additional two years of subspecialty fellowship training in endovascular surgical neuroradiology, neurointerventional surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. After completing his training, he joined the St. Paul Radiology, a large private practice group in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota, where he provided neurointerventional services for eight hospitals and two children's hospitals throughout the region for several years before joining Christiana Care in 2014. Since joining the Christiana team, he has served on the Stroke Leadership Committee and is an Associate Director of Christiana Care's Comprehensive Stroke Program. Doctor has also been selected to serve on the state's neurointerventional representative uh, on the Delaware Stroke System of Care. Doctor, we'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tim, for the great introduction, and thanks uh, for having me as a speaker tonight. I'm just going to get my screen up here. One second. All right, can you guys see that? Yep, looks great. All right, welcome everyone and thanks again for having me and thanks for joining uh, uh, for tonight's uh, mini medical school session on neurointerventional surgery. So what I'd like to do tonight is to, first of all, describe the field of neurointerventional surgery. It's a very subspecialized field that not a lot of people really know about or know what we do. 
And also we'll talk a little bit about the path to get here, uh, how I got here and also what the other paths are, if, if it's something that uh, anyone's interested in. And then I'll also do an overview of some of the more common uh, uh, procedures that we do within our field. And uh, specifically, I, I think a, a lot of the work we do involves uh, brain aneurysms or intracranial aneurysms and stroke. So we'll talk specifically a little more detail about uh, those uh, types of diseases and procedures. So what is neurointerventional surgery? It's a field of medicine that encompasses minimally invasive image-guided procedures to diagnose and treat diseases of the brain and spine. So it's a very, uh, just a very simple uh, definition. Um, and how, so how do you get here? So for anyone that is interested in medicine or goes into the field of medicine, obviously there's the basic work, which is a bachelor's degree or undergraduate degree, uh, typically four years. Uh, for me, as uh, Tim mentioned, I did that at the University of Pennsylvania, where I got a Bachelor of Arts degree in the biological basis of behavior. Uh, so at the at University of Pennsylvania, that was a fairly popular degree um, when I was there for uh, people that were interested in going to medical school. Um, and I subspecialized even within that in neurosciences. I always had an interest in neurosciences and that, um, that major did allow me to um, uh, focus on that uh, before medical school. So I did go to medical school uh, at the University of Tennessee. Uh, the medical campus was in Memphis. I spent four years there in medical school. And you know, I, I encourage any of you that are interested in medicine to keep an open mind. Because I, I, even though I had an interest in neurosciences, I probably changed my mind about uh, what field I wanted to go into probably four or five times as, as I went through my different rotations uh, before ultimately deciding on uh, doing uh, what I'm doing now. So do keep an open mind as you go through uh, medical school for those of you who are going down that path. So after medical school, typically, you know, you do choose a subspecialty uh, of, uh, or a specialty within medicine that you want to go into. And usually, even if you're going into a subspecialized field like I did, you do go do a year of internship. So I did my internship here actually at the University of Tennessee, where I did my medical school training. And then from there, I went on to do a residency in radiology. Now to get into neurointerventional surgery, this is actually one of the very few fields in medicine where you can take a path uh, through different residency programs. So I chose radiology. So including my internship year, that was a, a five-year uh, residency, which I did at the Ohio State University. However, you could also do neurointerventional surgery going through neurology, which is uh, four years, including the internship or through neurosurgery, which is typically six or seven years, depending on the program that you choose. After residency, you do more subspecialized training in fellowship. So as a radiologist, I did, um, and, and that fellowship is typically one to two years. As a radiologist, I subspecialized in neuroradiology. So that's specifically imaging of the brain and spine. So radiology, as you all know, is you know uh, all of imaging, x-rays, CAT scan, MRI scans, all different types of uh, imaging procedures of the entire body. But to do neurointerventional surgery, I had to do specialized training in imaging of the brain and spine. And that can be a one or two year fellowship. I did one year at the University of Pennsylvania. And then after that is when I did my neurointerventional training. Now, if you had chosen the neurology pathway after your four years of neurology residency, you do have to do special training in either vascular neurology or what we call stroke neurology, uh, which is specifically dealing with the, the blood vessel issues of the brain, medical management of that, or neurocritical care. And that's uh, typically a one to two year fellowship training for the neurologist. And if you're a neurosurgeon, if you did a neurosurgery residency, a lot of these programs do include a year that, that can be dedicated to either research or uh, elective within the residency program. So a lot of people that do neurosurgery that want to do neurointerventional surgery incorporate a year of neurointerventional surgery training during their six or seven year uh, residency. So after you complete your residency training, whether it's radiology, neurology, or neurosurgery, and then you do your specialized fellowship training, that's when then you can go into the dedicated fellowship for neurointerventional surgery, uh, which is one to two years. And I did a two-year um, neurointerventional fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. So uh, it is quite a lengthy road to get there, but um, that those are the different pathways you can choose to ultimately do uh, neurointerventional surgery. So depending on you know which pathway you choose, you might hear different terms. So as a radiologist, a lot of people refer to uh, me or us as interventional neuroradiologists. 
uh, a neurologist doing this might be called an interventional neurologist, and a neurosurgeon who does this might be called an endovascular neurosurgeon, but collectively, all of us together as a field, we call ourselves neurointerventional surgeons. And that so that term neurointerventional surgeon could be referring to a radiologist, neurologist, or neurosurgeon who went through the subspecialized training pathway to do these types of procedures uh, specifically, okay? So, you know, the, the, what is, you know, the spectrum of the, the, the work that we do, they are all, for the most part, procedures, and the bulk of what we do involve what we call endovascular procedures of the brain and spine. Endovascular meaning going through the blood vessels, so through a little catheter, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, uh, 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 procedures involving the brain and spine, and a bulk of what we do has to do with treatment of patients who have stroke. So strokes can be divided into two main categories, what we call ischemic and what we call hemorrhagic. Ischemic is related to blockage of an artery or reduced blood flow to the brain. That accounts for actually the vast majority of strokes, nearly 90%, 87% or so of strokes are what we call ischemic stroke related to reduced blood flow from blockage of an artery. The minority, about 13%, are called hemorrhagic stroke, and that's related to bleeding in the brain from a, a few different causes, which we'll, we'll talk about. So what is a neurointerventionalist or neurointerventional surgeon? What do we do? Well, we treat diseases that involve blockages in the brain and ruptures or bleeding in the brain. So in a sense, when you you know kind of think of it that way, we're kind of like brain plumbers, right? So, uh, you know, sometimes we jokingly call ourselves brain plumbers because that is a large portion of what we do is related to blockages or leak, leaks in the brain. Now, that is only one component of that. So endovascular procedures involving the blood vessels in the brain and spine is one component. But we also do, uh, you know, depending on our training pathway, sometimes do other procedures. And those include minimally invasive procedures involving the spine and also other image guided procedures. So when we talk specifically about endovascular procedures, again, endovascular meaning through the blood vessels. Uh, so these are minimally invasive as opposed to going in uh, through open surgery. The, a lot of what we do is called, uh, involves cerebral angiography. So these are uh, procedures that involve taking a, a catheter, which is a flex, small flexible tube into the artery and taking pictures of the blood vessels in the brain or the spine. Uh, when we talk about stroke, as I mentioned, when there's blockages, we do a procedure called mechanical thrombectomy to open up those blockages. Uh, we do procedures called stenting or angioplasty. Angioplasty involves blowing up a balloon to open up arteries. And you may have heard of some of these procedures for the heart as well. I think you recently had a, a talk from Dr. Wimmer about similar procedures for the heart. And we do similar types of things in the head and neck area. So angioplasty is blowing up a balloon to open up arteries. Stenting is putting in a, a metal tube, uh, made out, uh, a mesh tube to uh, keep the arteries open. So we can do that in the head, intracranial, or in the neck, extracranial. We could do procedures called embolization. So embolization basically is a generic term for blocking something off, blocking off an abnormality, blocking off an artery. Um, and we can do that for aneurysms, which we'll uh, talk about in a little more detail in this talk. And also uh, we could do embolization for a type of vascular malformation called an AVM. So AVM is an acronym that stands for arteriovenous malformation or AVF, which is arteriovenous fistula. So these types of lesions or abnormalities basically are abnormal connections in the blood vessels in the brain or spine. So you can see that in the pictures here. The picture on the lower left here is a CAT scan with dye. So all of this bright stuff here shouldn't be here. And that's an AVM, arteriovenous malformation. So when we did a cerebral angiogram on this patient, where we put a catheter into the artery and injected dye, this is what it looks like. So you can see that normally these arteries are, arteries are like tree branches. They go out and branch off into little, little blood vessels uh, that get smaller and smaller. The abnormal part is in this big blob of, of dye you see here, and that's the AVM. So we can go in with a catheter and block these things off with embolization procedures. We can do that again in the brain. We can also do that outside of the brain uh, for different disease processes. So one is epistaxis. So epistaxis is the medical term for nosebleed. So we probably all have had nosebleeds for the most part. We you know squeeze your nose, it probably stops. Some nosebleeds are so bad that you can't get that to stop at home. So a lot of people will end up going to uh, urgent care or the primary care doctor or an ENT. And there are some uh, procedures you could do with the swab into the nose to try and, and, and stop the bleeding that way or cauterization procedures. 
But some bleeds are so bad that patients end up in the hospital uh, where they can often have uh, uh, balloons inflated in their nose to try and stop the bleeding. And when that doesn't work, they often call us to do an embolization procedure where we actually take a little catheter into the arteries that feed the nose and block them off with embolization to treat the nosebleed. We can do a procedure called tumor embolization. So tumors in the head and neck, sometimes in the brain, sometimes out of the brain. Uh, when they go to surgery, a lot of these tumors have a lot of bleeding. So we often do an embolization procedure before the surgery to reduce the blood flow to help the surgeons with the amount of bleeding that they encounter during these surgeries. We uh, deal with a procedure called carotid blowouts. So the carotid arteries are the, the big arteries here that you can feel in the neck on either side. Uh, carotid blowout is when there's an injury to that artery and the, the blood is just pouring out of the neck. So we do see that sometimes with trauma when there's a, a penetrating injury into the neck and it injures the carotid artery. Uh, but we often see that also with cancer. So head and neck cancer, sometimes these tumors are really aggressive. They can eat into the artery They can and, and they can cause bleeding that way. And then sometimes patients with head and neck cancer that get radiation treatment the radiation itself can cause tissue injury, which can uh, get down to the blood vessel and the carotid can start bleeding out. So those are really life-threatening procedures. You can imagine a lot of blood pouring out through the carotid artery. Uh, won't you, you know, a patient's not gonna be able to survive that. So those are, again, an emergent procedure where we have to come in and try and control that bleeding through a catheter uh, to, to stabilize the patients. Uh, we do sometimes procedures called vasospasm treatment. So the most commonly we see that with patients with ruptured brain aneurysms where the bleeding triggers a pathway that causes the arteries that go to the brain to start spasming down. So when the arteries spasm down, it can actually reduce blood flow to the brain. And the risk of that is stroke if the brain isn't getting enough blood flow. Uh, so if the patients aren't able to get treated adequately with just you know giving them IV fluids and getting their blood pressures up, sometimes we go in with a catheter and try and open up the arteries either, either by injecting medicine directly into the arteries to help them relax or doing that procedure called angioplasty that I talked about with the balloon to open up the arteries. So uh, those are uh, some of the procedures we do with vasospasm. All of these procedures I've talked about for the brain, we can also do in the spine. So we do angiography, take pictures uh, of the blood vessels in the spine and also can do all sorts of embolization uh, procedures in the spine. Most of these procedures I'm talking about involve the arteries, which are the high pressure system that carry the blood from the heart through the, uh, all of the tissues in the body, including the brain. And then the veins are the uh, vessels that drain the blood back to the heart. So that we can also do similar procedures in the veins. So we can do thrombectomy, which is removing clot when there's clot blocking the veins in the head. And that can result in elevated pressures in the head and bleeding. So that, that is a procedure we sometimes do in the veins in the head. We can do the angioplasty and stenting procedures when the veins are narrowed, if we think that's causing a major issue. Um, and, and those types of things are, uh, they can cause really bad headaches. Sometimes patients have what's called tinnitus, um, which is hearing their heartbeat in their ear, like a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh kind of sound it can be related to a narrowed vein in the head. Um, we can, and sometimes it can cause blurry vision. So a lot of different symptoms you can get from that. So we do sometimes these procedures in the veins as well. We can do a test, a procedure called balloon test occlusion, um, and that's involving blowing up a balloon in an artery and seeing if it causes a problem for the patient. And th there's a variety of procedures we do that uh, prior to, including sometimes surgery that might involve blocking an artery in the head or before an embolization procedure where we're going to block off an artery. We want to see if we blow up a balloon, is that kind of going to cause the patient a problem before we actually do the permanent occlusion of the, of the vessel? So that's called balloon test occlusion. WADA testing, we don't do this frequently, but this is actually a very uh, interesting uh, procedure. It's usually done in kids, and it's usually done before surgery for uh, seizures. So when we localize a seizure to one side of the brain or the other, sometimes the treatment for that is actually for a neurosurgeon to go in and surgically remove that part of the brain that we think is causing the seizure to treat the patient's seizure. So one important thing we need to know is what are the important things around that area that could potentially get injured? And uh, one of those is strength. And you know another important function is speech. So usually the left side of the brain for the most part affects strength on the right side of the body. The right side of the brain affects uh, strength on the left side of the body. So it's kind of you know crisscrossed, uh, which side of the brain affects strength on the opposite side of the body. Now, language or speech for most people is located in the left, left hemisphere, left side of the brain. So if we're going to go and operate on one side of the brain, we need to know is 
language on that side or is it on the other side? So this procedure, WADA testing, involves putting a catheter into the carotid artery on one side at a time. We take a picture. We do a baseline neuro exam where we check the patient's strength, their ability to speak, and things like that. Then we inject a medication that basically paralyzes that half of the brain temporarily. And then we do all of that testing again. Almost always, it's going to cause weakness on the other side of the body, which we expect. And then it allows us to, to test speech. So if we, if we see that the patient's speech is affected, then we have to be aware that uh, a surgery on that side could affect the patient's speech. So we do that test on both sides, and that helps us localize which side of the, uh, of the brain uh, speech is located on prior to surgery. All right. It looks like I, I don't, uh, so it's like some questions. Uh, I can go, yeah. So a question was asked, what material is the balloon that you use in embolization? Uh, has there ever been time where it has popped inside the body? And if so, what are your next steps? So the balloon is actually made out, It's uh, there are different materials. It's, it's kind of like a plastic kind of material. So we inflate them and deflate them usually by injecting a combination of saline and dye. So we can visualize it going up and down as it, as it goes up, uh, inflates and deflates in the blood vessel. Um, what you know, It is possible for a balloon to rupture if you put too much of that dye or uh, um, saline into the, uh, into the balloon, it can rupture. For the most part, it doesn't cause a problem because it ruptures and collapses and it stays attached to the catheter, it can get pulled out. So they are uh, attached to a catheter and we can pull them out. Now, you do have to be careful that the balloon, if it's bigger than the blood vessel and you inflate it too high, it can rupture the blood vessel. So that is a, that is a problem you can encounter. So we are very careful with the size of the balloon. They come in different sizes. We size them based on the size of the blood vessel. And we are very careful when we inflate them and deflate them because we do this under continuous, what we call fluoroscopic guidance or x-ray guidance. We can actually see it going up. We can see it going down. And we have to gauge that relative to the size of the blood vessel. So we have to be very careful when we do that. Um, if the vessel ruptures, then we have to take a series of steps to stop the bleeding. But for the most part, if the balloon itself ruptures and the vessel is okay, we, have, we can simply pull out the balloon because it's attached to the catheter. All right. Now, other types of procedures. Everything I talked about uh, up to this point has been endovascular procedures through a catheter involving the blood vessels. So what do we do in the spine? So there's a variety of procedures we do in the spine. Um, one is called vertebral augmentation or vertebroplasty, which involves basically uh, injecting cement into a fractured spine. So here on the bottom right here, there's two different pictures here, right? So the, this is basically an x-ray picture of the spine. So here are what we call the vertebral bodies, these rectangular spaces. And what you're seeing here, this dark line is a needle that we're putting in through the skin under x-ray guidance into this vertebral body. So this is a patient that had a fracture of the spine that was causing severe pain that was limiting their ability to, to do anything really, to move around or do anything. So through that needle under, again, x-ray guidance, we can inject cement. So the black you're seeing in this other picture is the cement that we've injected into the spine through the needle. And at the end of the procedure, the needle comes out, the cement stays in the spine, the cement hardens within seconds and helps stabilize the fracture. Kyphoplasty is a similar procedure, but it basically simply involves blowing up a balloon inside of the bone before you inject the cement. So these procedures are used to treat fractures in the spine that do not respond or that haven't responded to just letting you know time heal them and that are, are still causing significant pain. And these procedures do uh, usually result in pretty significant pain relief for some of these patients. We do different types of pain injections. So you may have heard of something called ep epidural steroid injections in patients that have back pain and sciatica or uh, pain that shoots down into the legs. Uh, we can do selective nerve root blocks that can also, again, address pain. It can help localize what levels are affected uh, before a patient goes to surgery and things like that. Uh, facet joints are these uh, joints along the, along the back of the spine that can also be a source of pain that we can do injections for. Uh, there's different kinds of nerve blocks that we can do that treat different kinds of pain syndromes. We do sometimes do biopsies under uh, imaging guidance. So similar approach to what I showed here for the uh, vertebroplasty procedure, we can take a, a biopsy needle into the spine and get samples. We can also get biopsy samples of the disc. So these rectangle things here are the spine. The spaces between them are where the disc spaces are. So the discs are basically the cushions between the bone that allow the, the, the spine to, to flex and things like that. So we can do biopsies there. 
We can do biopsies of masses around the spine. We can do lumbar punctures or spinal taps to get fluid out of the spinal canal. Myelography involves putting a small needle into the spinal fluid in the spinal canal and, and injecting dye. Then we can take pictures both under x-ray or, or CAT scan to see how that dye flows, look at the nerves and things like that. That can be a uh, something we do preoperatively to help localize again where we think pain might be coming from or that type of thing. Blood patches are a, 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 a procedure that are used uh, that's used to treat what we call CSF leak. So CSF is spinal fluid. Some patients can get that after a spinal tap where the, the fluid continues to leak. So one of the procedures we do is basically put a needle just around where the spinal fluid is, take some of uh, the patient's own blood and inject it back into the spinal canal and the blood actually helps patch that little hole. So that's one procedure we do uh, periodically. We can do lumbar drains, which are putting drainage catheters into the spinal fluid under x-ray and drain some of the spinal fluid for a, a, a variety of different uh, reasons. So those are a, a variety of uh, different spine procedures that we do. And occasionally we do other image guided procedures of the head and neck as well, like biopsies of masses and things like that. So quite a few different kinds of procedures uh, depending on our, our training uh, that we can do. Um, so another question, would a regular ortho surgeon be able to perform these surgeries for the spine or is it only specifically your specialty? So a uh, good question. So an orthopedic surgeon does actually the spine surgery. They do the uh, open surgeries in the spine. Most orthopedic surgeons themselves don't do most of these other procedures, meaning the pain injections. Some of them do the vertebroplasty procedure, some don't, uh, but a lot of the biopsies and pain injections are usually not done by an orthopedic surgeon. Um, there are a variety of different pain uh, doctors that do these, not only neurodimensional surgeons. Um, there are, in fact, some neurodimensional surgeons do, don't do pain uh, 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 procedures like this at all. There are other types of pain uh, uh, physicians out there that can do these. Some are, are trained through anesthesiology. Some are trained to, uh, through a specialty called physical medicine and rehabilitation. So there are other pathways that, uh, that doctors can go through to get trained in doing these um, pain injections and biopsies and things like that. Um, most orthopedic surgeons don't do that, but some of them do do the, uh, the vertebroplasty, the cement procedures. Um, the most common, let's see, uh, some other questions here. When testing to determine what side of function is controlled speech, how long um, how long does it take? Is the patient awake? Yes, the patient is awake because we don't want to give them medicine to make them sleepy because it can kind of confound uh, the assessment that we have. Uh, the procedure does not take very long. When we inject the medicine that basically puts that half of the brain to sleep temporarily, that medicine takes effect right away within seconds. And the testing happens within minutes after that. So usually, you know, within 30 minutes to an hour, we've done the testing for both sides. The most common surgery that we do involves angiography, which is the blood vessel procedures, and then treating strokes and brain aneurysms that we'll, uh, we'll get to here. And then um, what kind of neurosurgeon does neck decompression? Um, so uh, so there's actually neurosurgeons, most neurosurgeons don't do spine surgery. So spine surgery can be done by a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon who have had uh, training specifically in spine surgery. So there's a couple different routes that surgeon, uh, surgeons can get to doing spine surgery as well. Um, uh, but most, I would say most neurosurgeons do spine surgery. It's a, actually a big part of their practice. All right, so moving forward here. So neuroendovascular procedures specifically do encompass the bulk of what we do uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, practice. So these involve, again, minimally invasive procedures through the blood vessels, through catheters. So it's done on a room that looks like this. So the, the type of procedures that we do, it's called digital subtraction angiography. So when we talk about doing a cerebral angiogram, where we put a catheter in, inject the dye, take some pictures, uh, the type of uh, angiography that's specific to neurotype procedures is called digital subtraction angiography. So we inject dye into a blood vessel through a catheter, and that's the angiography part, but the digital subtraction means the computer actually subtracts the bone away from the picture so we can actually see the blood vessels better, and I'll show you a picture of that. And we use a machine that uh, gives us the ability to do what we call bi biplane fluoroscopy. So if you look at the picture here, you see kind of, you know, one 
uh, arc or uh, what we call a C-arm here, and you see a second one here. So not all procedures require two uh, C-arms, so two planes like that. Most other procedures don't. For example, for cardiac procedures, for the most part, you don't need that. For these kinds of procedures involving the rest of the body, you usually don't need that. The reason we need two um, two of these units uh, when we do our procedures is because we need to be able to see in two different planes at the same time. So two views at the same time. And these, machi these machines are what we call fluoroscopy. So they do generate radiation. So when we do these procedures, we're actually wearing lead under the uh, gowns when we do these procedures. So this is a picture of, of a room that we typically use, a very standard kind of a room. So we have uh, patients on the table here, laying usually laying flat. You can see that there's a everything is done with sterile technique. So there's a sterile drape over the patient. Uh, the physicians are also uh, scrubbed in sterilely with a mask, a hat, and a gown. Again, we are usually wearing lead underneath the gown to protect us from the radiation since we're standing right next to the uh, uh, the, the machine here. So as we do these procedures. Uh, taking these pictures, we have these screens in front of us. So we can see live as we're injecting the dye, taking these pictures as we work through these uh, procedures. And this is actually a picture of two of my partners. This is Dr. Bar Balbani and Dr. Greg Zawarski in our procedure room. So you can see here, they're looking, they're scrubbed in, sterile, mask and hat. Underneath the gown, they're wearing their lead. Patients laying flat here, draped in a sterile uh, uh, drape here. Again, the screens allow us to view uh, two different planes at one time. You can see the machines behind them. So this golden arc here, you can see that it's not McDonald's. That's actually one of the C arms that we're uh, do using for x-ray. And then the other one is right here. So we can see one is giving us a picture front to back. One is giving us a picture side to side. So we have controls on the side of this machine that allows us to rotate these and give us the angles, different angles that we need to do our procedures. So these are actually very... Uh, highly technologically advanced rooms that are multi-million dollar rooms. So these are um, uh, big investments for the hospital uh, when we uh, get these types of rooms to do these uh, subspecialized procedures like this. So how do we do these procedures? How do we get access? So one of the, you know, the important thing is how do we get into the artery or the vein? So typically these procedures are done through the femoral artery usually the right femoral artery, the right common femoral artery, which is in the crease of the leg near the groin region. So in this picture here, here's the sterile drape. The, the feet are down towards the bottom of the screen. The patient's head's towards this, the top. So you can see the drape has two cutouts, and these are placed over the regions of the femoral arteries, okay? So the, the crease of the leg would be right about here and here, and that's where the femoral arteries are that we access to get uh, into the artery to do these procedures. Alternate routes, if we're not, a lot of our procedures actually we do through the radial artery in the wrist, the base of the wrist rather than the femoral artery. If we can't get into those options, uh, another option is the upper arm, the brachial artery near the, the biceps muscle. And very rarely actually, whoops, uh, we can um, go into the um, uh, carotid artery directly in the neck. We try to avoid that just because that tends to be a higher risk of complications and things like that when you go in here. But if we can't get into the head any other way, sometimes we do actually put the catheter directly in through the carotid artery in the neck. So when we do these procedures, now if we're just taking pictures for an angiogram, for example, a lot of times we don't have to put patients to sleep with a breathing tube. We can just use a little bit of sedation through the IV. We call that moderate sedation just to keep them comfortable for the procedure. On top of that, we use a local anesthetic, typically lidocaine to numb the excuse me, to numb the skin. So we'll give that in the skin here in the, uh, over the, the femoral artery or in the wrist before we actually uh, uh, put the needle into the, uh, to the blood vessel. The incision for these is very small. So three to five millimeters on average, depending on the size of the little catheter we're putting in, they're very small incisions uh, that we use for these procedures. And that's why we call them minimally invasive. Once we do that, we put a small needle right into the artery from the skin into the artery. We put a little wire through the needle into the artery, then the needle comes out. So then we, once we have the little wire in the artery, over that wire, we, we thread in what we call a sheath. So here's a picture of some different sheaths. They're basically short, little plastic flexible tubes. And here's a picture of it going into the femoral artery. So once that sheath is in, it's basically what gives us access in and out of that artery. And then we can put our different tubes or different catheters through that to do our pictures and things like that. So that's how we get access in the artery or the vein to do, the, do these kinds of procedures. So once we have that, we advance a catheter over a wire into the 
aortic arch and we select the vessel. So for basic anatomy here, this is a picture of the sheath or into the femoral artery here in the crease of the leg. This is the aorta, the big vessel that comes down from the art down uh, the heart down through the body. So we guide that under this uh, uh, the X-ray or fluoroscopic guidance in up into the top of the aorta, and that, that's where the blood vessels to the brain come off. So that's how we typically will get into these arteries that feed the brain. If we're going through the wrist or the arm, same thing. We come up through the arm, back down into the aorta, and then from there we can pick which vessels we need to get into to take these pictures. So from one one access point. Uh, either the femoral artery or the wrist, from either point, we can get into all of the blood vessels that go into the brain. Catheters come in different sizes and shapes depending on where we're trying to go. And then again, we put a little wire through that catheter to help guide the catheter into the vessels that we need to uh, need to get into. So here's a picture of an angiogram. So on this picture on the far left of the screen, this dye that I'm injecting into the right internal carotid artery into the right side of the patient's head. So this is an example of what digital subtraction angiography is. If we didn't have the digital subtraction, we'd be looking through the patient's skull like this. So you can see the skull here, this is where the right eye would be, this is where the nose would be, the left eye is over here. And you can see that you could see the dye but it's very hard to see the little blood vessels in the head. So digital subtraction is where the computer subtracts out the skull and gives us a very good look at just the, the dye that's going through the blood vessels. So that's what digital subtraction angiography allows us to see. And then the other thing that we do in our neuro rooms is what I mentioned, biplane angiography. So with one dye injection, it gives us a picture on two different views. So this is what we call an AP view. AP is means anteroposterior, anterior to posterior or front to back. So it's almost like a front view. And here's lateral. So lateral is kind of like a side view. So with one dye injection, I'm able to see both the front view and a side view uh, to give us uh, give me a, a better idea of how the, the uh, blood's flowing through the vessel. So on the side view here, patient's face is on the right side of the screen. The back of the head is on the left side of the screen. The tip of the catheter. So this line that I drew right here, that's actually at the base of the skull. So this is all part of the skull. Below that is the neck. So you can see that the catheter tip is actually right down here. So we don't have to actually put the catheter in the head to take pictures. The catheter is in the neck. We inject dye, and we can get the pictures of that dye as it goes through the brain. So that's what angiography uh, looks like when we take these pictures. All right. Um, I can look at, let's see, a few more questions came through here. Uh, the weight limit on the machine. That's a good question. They do vary, but on our newest machine, we can handle a patient up to about 600 pounds, um, so, which does accommodate most of the patients that we see. Uh, can the radiation affect the patients at all? Absolutely. But given that the patients, for the most part, are going through a single procedure or only a couple of procedures through their lifetime, so the amount of radiation that they're getting, for the most part, isn't going to have negative long-term effects. Now, there are certain limits or thresholds of radiation after which we may expect to see some complications. For example, one of the, the more common things for us is we're doing a lengthy procedure with a lot of focused radiation right on the head, and it's entering at a certain you know a, a point through the head. The cumulative radiation dose could affect the skin. It can cause irritation of the skin, redness, itching. It can even cause hair loss. That's probably the most common thing we see if we're doing a really, really long procedure, but that's only very rarely that we see that. Cumulatively, um, uh, I, I think the, the, the effects of the patient are minimal. Uh, everyone else in the room, us, our team members in the room, we wear lead because obviously we're doing these procedures all day long and, and are getting a lot of radiation. So we do want to protect ourselves. The patient can't have the, the lead shields because then we wouldn't be able to see. That's, that's why they're not uh, generally wearing uh, the lead. Uh, virtual knife surgery. I think uh, uh, there's a question about virtual knife surgery. I think it's talking about cyber knife. So cyber knife is targeted radiation therapy that we do for different kinds of tumors. Um, and some of these brain vascular malformations. So that's a non-invasive treatment involving targeted radiation for different types of uh, tumors and vascular malformations. Uh, wires and catheters, can they contribute to the blockage? So if you're taking a catheter through a narrowed area, yes, it can cause a uh, blockage, but we're not typically in there very long. And the catheters are very, very small on the scale of usually one to two millimeters. And most of the blood vessels that we're in are larger than that. Now, when we take small, what we call micro catheters into the small vessels in the brain, which, which are, you know, millimeter or less, then we do have to be careful with, are we reducing blood flow and things like that? Um, 
can you steer the wires? Yes, you can. So the wires uh, can have a shape on them, a little curve. And on the back end of the wire, we put in a, a little plastic device that screws on that we call a torque device. So we put that on as we turn the torque device on the back end, on, on, on the back end where we're working under extra, we can see the little wire tip rotate. So that is actually what helps us guide the wire into specific vessels that we want and helps guide the catheters into the vessels that we want as well. If someone's allergic to dye, another question that came up, uh, depending on the severity of the allergy, uh, we can do one of a couple of things. If the allergic reaction is um, hives or itching or something milder like that, we do pre-medication for that with uh, things like steroids and Benadryl, which reduces the likelihood of that happening. The most severe kind of allergy is called anaphylaxis, which can result in swelling of the lips, the throat, and can actually stop someone from breathing. So we try to avoid doing these procedures unless we absolutely have to. And in those patients, oftentimes they are uh, intubated with a breathing tube to protect the airway in the event that were to happen. Um, what do you think want the next advancement in this field to be? That's a good question that I'll have to think about. Um, even with the radiation uh, vests that we wear, can they uh, can we that it cause skin problems or disease later on in life? That's a good question. Uh, we try to protect the organs that are most vulnerable to us uh, to radiation injury. That in involves the eyes, so we do wear leaded goggles uh, when we can. The thyroid gland, we wear a shield specifically to, to cover the thyroid gland, and we do cover all of the organs in our chest and abdomen, and then our uh, genital areas as well, because the reproductive organs are also more susceptible to uh, radiation injury. So those areas are all covered. When we're wearing that lead and that protection, radiation dose to those areas is minimal. We're hardly getting any radiation to those areas. So, But that does leave, for example, the skin of the face, the arms and legs, like what happens there. The radiation effects on those parts of the body is very, very minimal. Now, if someone has prolonged exposure, can it cause things like skin cancer, blood cancers? The answer to that probably is yes, but the um, um, but the likelihood of that is much, much lower. All right, great questions, guys. So I'm going to keep going here. All right, let's talk a little bit about brain aneurysm, intracranial aneurysm. So this is one of the bigger um, uh, disease states that we treat. What, what is an aneurysm? It's an abnormal dilation of an artery. So as I mentioned earlier, as the blood vessels go out through the body and specifically in the brain, they're like tree branches. So as they go farther and farther out, they should get smaller and smaller like branches of a tree. When there's dilation or where an artery gets bigger than it should is what we call an aneurysm. They can happen anywhere in the body, but they do tend to be more common in the arteries of the brain. And part of that is because the, the vessels in the brain have thinner walls than vessels uh, in a lot of different places in the body. There are different kinds of aneurysms. A saccular aneurysm is basically like a sac hanging off the side of a, a, a blood vessel. You could see that uh, in the drawing here. As opposed to that, a fusiform aneurysm is where the entire blood vessel dilates and gets big. So it's not just a ball hanging off the side of a blood vessel, it's the whole blood vessel dilating and getting bigger than it should. A dissecting aneurysm is a specific kind of aneurysm related to an injury or tear in the blood vessel that you see in the drawing here that allows blood to leak around the wall of the artery and call what we call a form what we call a pseudo aneurysm. So those are different kinds of aneurysms that we sometimes have to deal with. The most common type we deal with is what we call a saccular aneurysm, or you may have heard the term berry aneurysm that's referring to a saccular aneurysm. <clears throat> Most of the time, if someone says uh, is talking about having a brain aneurysm, it's going to be that saccular type. The prevalence of brain aneurysms is about 3%. So that means out of a, a hundred people, a uh, hundred random people, about three of us are going to have an aneurysm. Most of them don't ever cause a problem. Most of us are going to live and die with it, never know we even, ha even had one because they don't cause a problem. It's probably only about one or 2% of brain aneurysms that ever do rupture. And that is the risk of an aneurysm, is risk of bleeding, rupturing. That risk can range anywhere from less than 1% to more than 10%. So not all aneurysms are the same and not, not all of them need to get treated. It depends on the size, the shape, location, and individual risk factors that determine what the rupture risk can be. And that's not an exact science, but we do our best to try and estimate what we think the rupture risk of an aneurysm is based on a lot of different factors that we take into account. So then we need to take into account what we think the risk of bleeding is for a specific aneurysm over the lifetime of that patient versus risk of treatment. And there's uh, different treatments that we'll talk about. 
So when an aneurysm bleeds, it can cause a type of bleeding called subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that involves bleeding into the cere uh, cerebrospinal fluid spaces or CSF spaces around the surface of the brain. So um, you see here, there's two different pictures of a CAT scan. So on the CAT scan, this one on the left here, the really bright is the skull. So that's the bone of the skull. The gray is the brain tissue. And all of these little dark spaces and lines that you see are spaces that are filled by cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. And normally that fluid is dark. When you have bleeding into that space from a ruptured aneurysm, it turns bright. So blood generally is going to be bright. When there's acute bleeding around the surface of the brain, that's what it looks like. So all of these spaces that should be dark, when they're bright, indicate this type of bleeding called subarachnoid hemorrhage. The most common cause of that is trauma. So trauma hitting your head is the most common cause of most kinds of bleeding in the brain. But in someone that hasn't had major head trauma, aneurysm rupture is the most common cause. So whenever we see a patient that come in, comes in with this kind of bleeding around the brain and they haven't had major trauma, we're all automatically concerned about a ruptured brain aneurysm because that is the most common cause of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And having uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is, is a bad problem, as you can imagine. The mortality overall of patients that come in with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, so subarachnoid hemorrhage related to ruptured brain aneurysm, aneurysm can be up to 40 to 50%. About 15% don't even get to the hospital because the bleeding is so severe, the pressure goes up in the head and they don't survive that initial bleed. So even of those that survive and get to the hospital, another 40 or 50% are gonna be disabled or have some permanent deficits from that. So really only about a third or so patients who have a ruptured brain aneurysm are gonna be able to go back to functionally living independently and things like that. So ruptured brain aneurysms are a bad problem. So we do wanna address that, you know, uh, aneurysms very, you know, we take them very seriously when we do find them. When you have a ruptured aneurysm, you can, have re-bleeding from the aneurysm. So if an aneurysm has bled and it's not treated, that risk can be up to two to 4% per day for that first week to 10 days after a rupture. It can be up to 30% during the first 30 days after a rupture. And then after the first month or so, uh, it goes down to about two to 4% per year after that. So anytime someone comes in with a ruptured brain aneurysm, we always treat it right away if we can. Uh, about 8% of patients that come in with ruptured brain aneurysms can have seizures as well. So sometimes that, that bleeding around the brain can trigger a seizure. Sometimes that bleeding can cause something called hydrocephalus. So hydrocephalus is buildup of the fluid in the brain. So if you look at this picture on the top left, again, this is the CAT scan of a normal uh, patient. So you could see these little curved uh, structures that are dark in the, it almost looks like a smiley face, right? Those are called the ventricles, and those are fluid-containing spaces deep in the brain. And that's normally, they look kind of small like that. Hydrocephalus is dilation of the ventricles because of blockage of the normal flow of the CSF because of the blood that's leaked out uh, from the ruptured aneurysm. So compared to the normal scan, look how big these dark areas are, are here now. That's because the blood or the spinal fluid isn't able to flow normally because the blood, which is this bright stuff here, has blocked the normal flow that's uh, fluid around the, uh, around the brain. When hydrocephalus happens, it can cause decreased level of consciousness. Patients can become drowsy, go into comatose state, that kind of thing. It can cause elevated pressures in the head. And sometimes it does require drainage with what we call a ventriculostomy or an external ventricular drain or EVD. And that's what this picture is showing. This white tube here is a, a, a catheter coming in through the skull into the ventricle to drain some of that CSF, drain some of that fluid and relieve that pressure. And that's placed by a neurosurgeon now by drilling, drilling a little hole in the skull, putting a drainage catheter in to relieve some of that pressure. So here's a, a drawing of that catheter going into the deep fluid spaces, then it's connected on the back end to a drainage bag and a monitor. So it's, you could see here, this is the, the drainage system collecting the spinal fluid, and we can actually check the pressures. We connect that through, you can see this white cord here that could get, gets plugged into a, a computer system. We can actually check what the pressure is in the head through that drainage catheter as well. Vasospasm, I mentioned that earlier. So what, what is that? Again, it's narrowing of the arteries to the brain that can happen after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Usually it doesn't come right away. It usually starts three or four or five days after the bleed. It can happen, you know, two to three weeks even after the bleed. Um, if it's not treated, it can result in stroke. 
And it is the leading cause of death or disability after subarachnoid hemorrhage in patients that have survived the initial bleed. Initially, what we try to do is give patients fluids and get their blood pressure higher to increase the blood flow through the brain. But if that's not enough, then we often take these patients back for catheter-based procedures to either infuse what we call vasodilators, so medications to try and dilate the blood vessels, or do an angioplasty with a balloon. So if you look at the top picture here, this is a normal angiogram, the normal caliber of the blood vessels that you're seeing here with vasospasm you can see how much smaller they got. So this is the same patient. Several days after a ruptured aneurysm, you could see spasm has caused those vessels to constrict and get very, very small. So again, if that gets really bad, it can reduce, to reduce blood flow to the brain and it can cause strokes. We are very aware of that and have to treat that very aggressively in patients that come in with uh, ruptured brain aneurysms. How do you treat aneurysms? Two main categories of treatment. One is surgery. One is through a catheter, and I'll, we'll go about, uh, through that in a little bit more detail here. So aneurysm clipping is an open surgical procedure that's done by a neurosurgeon. So not me as a neurointerventionalist, does, I don't do these procedures. This is done by our neurosurgery colleagues. This procedure has been around since the 1930s. Now it's an invasive procedure. So with that, it comes longer recovery times. For un patients that come in with unruptured brain aneurysms, they're usually in the hospital for several days, then they go home, but it's often weeks to months before they're back to 100%. Now, the reason I say uh, for unruptured aneurysms is because when a, a patient comes in with a ruptured brain aneurysm, they're typically in the hospital for two to three weeks. So it is a long recovery phase, in, even in the hospital uh, after a ruptured aneurysm, and then there's even a longer recovery after that. For an unruptured aneurysm, so say one that we found on imaging before it bled, um, this is what we're talking about here. Several days in the hospital after surgery, a few weeks to months before getting back to 100% after the surgery. So this picture is showing diff uh, several uh, different types of clips that a neurosurgeon can use to put on the aneurysm. And it's a very durable treatment, meaning once that clip goes on and the aneurysm is gone, the chance that it's going to come back is very, very low. So these are typically done under a microscope. So you can see in this drawing here, the neurosurgeon basically you shave part of the head, make an incision in the scalp peel down the skin, the neurosurgeon will then cut down or cut out a piece of the bone to have access down inside of the head. They'll very carefully dissect down to the blood vessel to find the aneurysm under a microscope. Uh, you can see them looking through a microscope here as they're working down on the patient's head here. Once they find the aneurysm and, and have, you know, um, freed it to be able to put the clip on it, they'll place that clip across the what we call the neck of the aneurysm. The neck is where it comes off of the artery. Once that clip goes on, it pinches down on the aneurysm so blood can't get into it and the aneurysm basically scar shuts down, scars down. So that's called surgical clipping. Here's a picture of a brain aneurysm. This is from an angiogram. Uh, you can see that these are all normal blood vessels. The aneurysm is this big blob right here. All right, so that's the aneurysm. That shouldn't be there. So from our angiogram, we can construct a special kind of picture that we call a 3D reconstruction. So you can see here a, a picture that's constructed from the angiogram that shows that aneurysm. That often helps our neurosurgeons guide them during the surgery. So after the surgery, the clipping, <clears throat> this is what it looks like. So you can see the shadows of what are three different clips. There's one here, one here, and one here. So these clips are coming down across the neck or the base of the aneurysm. Once those clips are on, you can see the blood is no longer filling the aneurysm and the arteries around them are filling. So this is an angiogram that we've taken actually in the operating room after those clips go on to make sure that the aneurysm is gone and the blood vessels look okay. So we often do angiograms after these clipping procedures to, to make sure everything looks good. So that's a, a, a case of aneurysm clipping. So as opposed to that, uh, instead of going in through the head, we can also treat aneurysms through a catheter. And that's what I do as a neurointerventional surgeon is treating aneurysms through catheters. That's one, one of our bigger procedures that we do. So it's a minimally invasive procedure performed by neurointerventionalists. This has been around since the 1990s. So more recent for about the last 30 years, we've been doing these procedures. Now these uh, do have shorter recovery times, as you can imagine, because we're not going in through the head. These are through this little incision in the wrist or the leg. So the recovery times are shorter. For an unruptured aneurysm patient, we usually just keep them one night in the hospital and they're usually back to uh, normal, back to 100% within a week. We just ask that they do just a few days of light activity. Most patients are up, up back to 100% within a few days to a week. The downside, one downside is depending on which method we uh, choose to treat the aneurysm and depending on the aneurysm, there's a slightly higher chance of the aneurysm recurring or coming back down the road as opposed to the open surgery. So here's a picture of an aneurysm. 
Um, we go into a catheter, either through the, the groin and the femoral artery or the, the wrist and the radial artery. We put a little tube called a catheter into the aneurysm. So you could see a little catheter with a, coming in over a wire into the aneurysm. Once a catheter is in the aneurysm, we feed in little pieces of metal wire called coils. Now, these are made out of platinum. They look like little pieces of string if you actually look at them. So here's some pictures of different coils that are really blown up big. But we put as many as we need in. They come in different shapes and sizes. We fill the aneurysm with these coils. They're permanent. The coils don't go anywhere. Once we're done, the coils stay in, and then we pull out the catheters. That's what a coiling procedure looks like, and that's how we seal off an aneurysm with coils. So here's a picture of an aneurysm. You can see this big blob at the top here. That shouldn't be there. That's the aneurysm. And you can see what the coils look like under our in our procedure under x-ray. These uh, little black lines are a bunch of coils that are filling the aneurysm that we place through a catheter from the inside of the blood vessel. So what if the aneurysm has what we call a wide neck? So you know this in this drawing here, the base of the aneurysm where it comes off from the artery is narrow, right? You can see how it's narrow here relative to the aneurysm. And when we have that shape, the coils do a really good job of sitting in the aneurysm. Well, when that neck gets wide, it increases the chance that those coils can drop down into the artery. And we don't want that to happen because when that happens, it can block the artery. It can cause clot to start forming in the artery and travel down the, uh, down the road into an artery in the brain causing a stroke. So when we have aneurysms that are wide neck that we worry about the coils dropping down, we sometimes have to use other techniques that we call adjunctive techniques to try and help keep the coils in place. And one of those is called stents. So stent assisted coil embolization means placing a stent in to help the coil stay in place in the artery. So stents are uh, mesh metal tubes, almost looks like a, a rolled up chain link fence. So you can see in this picture here, this is an aneurysm that had a wide neck where if the coils were put in by themselves, they might drop down and block the artery. You can see here when we put the stent in, it provides a little support or scaffold that helps keep those coils in the aneurysm, prevents them from dropping down and keeps that artery open. So that's an example of how we can use stents to do uh, coiling to help keep the artery open. So here's another picture of an aneurysm. So all of these black lines are normal. The aneurysm is that blob at the top. And this kind of reminds me of one of these like um, uh, windsock men, right? So uh, the aneurysm would be the head here, right? That's the aneurysm, that shouldn't be there. So in this patient, we put a stent in. So these little black dots you see now in the artery here, those are the proximal and distal parts of the stent that we put in through the catheter that's following that shape here going across the what we call the neck of the aneurysm to provide a little bit of support here for the coils. So once that stent is in, then we were able to put those coils through a, a catheter into the aneurysm. And you can see that stent is coming right across the neck here to keep that artery open, keep the coils up in place so those coils don't drop down and block the artery. So that's an example of stent, what we call stent-assisted coil embolization. We can also do uh, something called what that we call Y-stent. So here's another patient with a different, similar aneurysm, but a little bit different. Again, reminds me of one of these windsock guys. So in this particular patient, we put a stent in. You could, you could see the four dots here and barely see them here. So the stent is going in from here to here. So again, we tried putting one stent in to see if we could get the, the, the stent to keep those coils up in the aneurysm. So with that stent in place, we started to put a coil into the aneurysm. You can see the loops here. These are, this is the coil that we're putting into a catheter, what we call a microcatheter that's positioned in the aneurysm. So if you look closely though, those coils are dropping down a little bit low. They're coming down into the vessel itself. And we were worried that that's gonna block the artery or cause a stroke. So we pulled the coil out. You can see where that first stent, in, uh, stent went in right here. But through that, we went in with another catheter and put in a second stent. And that's where we get this Y configuration. So now we have two stents, one going out each blood vessel at the base of the aneurysm. And then we can put a catheter through the stents. This is the, the tip of the, what we call a microcatheter inside of the aneurysm. Through that, we feed in more coils. You can see now with both stents in place, it ha has helped keep those coils out of the artery. So now you can see where the vessel begins. There's no coils dropping down below that. And we call that Y stenting, two stents that are going out in two different limbs to help keep those coils in place. There's a specialized kind of stent called a flow diverting stent. So the concept here is instead of filling the aneurysm with coils, why not divert flow away from the aneurysm? So flow diverting stents 
are very tightly braided mesh stents that allow flow into the normal arteries, but it reduces the flow in and out of the aneurysm. It causes stagnation in the aneurysm and the aneurysm starts to clot off. So you can look at that picture here. This is an example of a flow diverting stent. And you can see the difference between the stents we were just talking about where the it's more like a chain link fence. It's more wide open. Flow diverting stents are like a tight mesh. So it actually helps reduce flow in and out of an aneurysm. So here's a patient this is an, uh, the carotid artery here is the normal artery. This big oval blob is the aneurysm that shouldn't be there. So right after we put the flow diverting stent in, you can see that there's a little bit of dye leaking into it, but it's already reducing the flow in and out of that aneurysm. So the aneurysm is not filling nearly as well after that flow diverting stent got put into place. So here is an, what's called an MRA, it's a specific kind of MRI scan looking at the blood vessels. So the white here is the normal carotid arteries. This white blob is the aneurysm. Six months after we put the stent in, you can see that blob is gone. So the arteries are open, the blob is gone. So this is how a fluid diverting stent works. So we don't have to go necessarily even into the aneurysm to do the coils. Another type of device that's relatively newer that's been around the past uh, several years, the type of uh, device we call an intrasacular device. So again, it is in the sac of the aneurysm. That's what intrasacular means. But instead of, again, putting a bunch of little metal wire coils in there, this is a, 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 a mesh device. It's called, this one is called the web. It's called, it stands for woven endobridge device. It's a sphere of woven wires, kind of like a basket. So it fills the aneurysm and also helps reduce flow into the aneurysm right at the base. So here's a picture of a patient that came in with a ruptured aneurysm. So the bright here is blood because of the bleeding from the aneurysm. This is from the CAT scan with dye that we call a CTA. So these lines are the normal blood vessels. That triangle thing here is the aneurysm. That shouldn't be there. And that's what causes bleeding. When we did the angiogram, it confirmed more or less what we saw from the CAT scan. So this triangle shaped thing here is the aneurysm, shouldn't be there. That's what bled. And this is after the treatment with the web device. You could see that you no longer see filling in that aneurysm and under x-ray, it almost to me looks like a marshmallow, but you could see the little dark dots on either side of it. And it's this mesh cage that sits in the aneurysm to, to prevent blood from getting in. All right, I mean, uh, it looks like eight o'clock. I've been answering questions as we go. So I do have one other thing to get through, but I can answer a few more questions here. Um, what's the oldest age that you would consider operating on for an aneurysm? So if a patient has come in with a ruptured aneurysm, bleeding from an aneurysm, most of those patients we are going to treat unless the patient is so uh, sick or so old that their goals of care would not, would suggest that they would not want us to do anything. So. For ruptured aneurysms, for the most part, we treat them as long as we think the patient's goals of care, meaning they would want us to treat them. Now, if they come in and we know, for example, that they were a really sick hospice patient, that they were near the end of their life and wouldn't want anything done, those patients we would not treat. For an unruptured aneurysm, that's a, it's a very tricky question. It does, uh, I think a lot of what we do is not just based on age alone, but functional status. So there are some, you know, 50 or 60 year old patients that are very sick, uh, may not have a long life expectancy or very debilitated, may not want very aggressive treatments. And there are some 80 year old patients that are probably gonna live another 10 to 15 years based on their genetics that you know, don't have major me uh, medical issues. And for those patients, really it just depends on what we think the risk of the aneurysm bleeding is over the rest of their life. So the things we take into consideration include size of the aneurysm, um, things like shape of the aneurysm, um, other risk factors, smoking, high blood pressure, family history, those things play a role. And we try to estimate what we think the bleeding risk from the aneurysm is versus the risk of the treatments. Because these treatments that we're talking about do also carry a risk of stroke, bleeding, and things like that. In general, those risks from the treatment are less than 5%, somewhere in the range of maybe, you know, 2 to 5%, depending on what we're doing. Um, so depending on the treatment risk, and what we think the patient's goals would be and their life expectancy, their health status, um, you know, that determines what we treat. Now, if, if I have to throw out a kind of a general number, I would say we're very hesitant to treat someone, say, that's maybe over 80 years old, um, just as a very generic number, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't, depending on the aneurysm and the patient. Um, is subarachnoid hemorrhage related to CTE. I guess I'm not sure CTE, what we're uh, referring to. Um, subarachnoid hemorrhage in general 
the most common cause, again, is head trauma. Second would be ruptured brain aneurysm, but there are a variety of other things that can cause it uh, uh, as well. So I'm not sure, again, what CTE is referring to. Uh, is it Why is it bad if there's blood in the brain? So the, the, the brain, you think of the, the brain or the head as a closed vault. You have your skull, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a bone in a fixed cavity. You have your brain, which fills that space, and you have your spinal fluid, which fills the space between the, the brain and the, the skull and provides a little bit of a cushion. If you add anything to that, it's going to increase the pressure inside of a fixed cavity. The brain does not do well with tolerating elevated pressure. So we have certain thresholds. And if that pressure gets too high, the brain's not going to function normally. It's going to get reduced blood flow and it can cause brain death. Um, so that's why blood in the brain in general is bad. Now, if you have a little bit of blood, say from trauma or certain types of bleeding, that doesn't mean you're going to go in a coma or you're going to die. It just all depends on where the blood is, how much pressure is exerting on the brain and things like that. Now, subarachnoid hemorrhage and different kinds of bleeds can also cause direct injury to blood tissue itself. Um, and so if parts of the brain are damaged from the blood, that's a, a separate issue. But those are the two main reasons is potentially direct injury to, to brain tissue that can cause brain tissue to be injured. Second is um, uh, elevated pressures in the brain. I believe uh, they question. meant CTE as in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Oh, okay. Um, it's generally not related to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Now, with certain types of encephalopathy, that you know, there are certain types of bleeding that can be related to encephalopathy. Um, there, those are very rare, very kind of uh, not very non-common things. So, very the more common types of subarachnoid hemorrhage or ruptured aneurysms are not related to CTE. Um, thanks for clarifying that. How do coils uh, help the aneurysm? Seems likely they, they should be on the outside. So the coils treat the aneurysm by filling the inside. That's exactly how they work. So the surgical uh, treatment is on the outside. So that metal clip from surgery, if you, if you imagine a ball of an aneurysm, the clip goes on the outside surgically, pinches it closed so that the blood can get into it. Now coiling is through the blood vessel. So we go inside the aneurysm from the inside fill that from the inside with the coils, the coils and uh, prevent blood from getting into the aneurysm. That's, and that's how uh, they work. So coils, uh, once they fill the aneurysm, prevent blood from getting into it. So uh, they protect the aneurysm from bleeding by filling the inside. If you clip or put coils in the aneurysm, will there be a new artery wall at the neck of the aneurysm after some time? That is actually the goal, is that the aneurysm developed because there's a weak spot in the wall of the of the artery, basically like a little weak area that resulted in a hole that caused that aneurysm to develop. So the goal of all of these treatments is to reinforce that hole so blood can't leak out through the end into the aneurysm. So with time, the goal is, would be like if you were to, and there have been studies done on this actually um, where they've taken samples of blood vessels out, looked at it under a microscope. And with time, they have seen layers of tissue form a, a, along the base of the coils, for example, to seal off the hole. Same thing happens with the stents, the fluid diverting stents and things like that. The goal is for the body to form a layer of tissue through the through the artery to heal that hole that caused the aneurysm to develop in the first place? Great question. So I'll uh, try to go through this other section quickly. Ischemic stroke is the other big category of uh, treatments that we, uh, uh, that we do. So uh, ischemic stroke is reduced by reduced blood flow to the brain. And that can be caused by blockages in the neck, for example, the carotid artery causing reduced blood flow. But the biggest of the procedures that we do are actually related to blockages in the arteries in the brain itself. So a clot travels up to the brain, blocks an artery, reduces blood flow to an area of the brain, and it causes a stroke. We have the saying when we, we talk about stroke that time is brain. Some of you may have heard of that. Why do we say that? Is because when a large vessel gets blocked in the brain. And so we call that a large vessel acute ischemic stroke. Nearly 2 million neurons, 2 million brain cells are lost every minute that vessel remains blocked. So what does that mean for brain aging? Compared to a normal brain aging, when you have a large vessel that's blocked in the brain, that brain ages about 3.6 years for every hour without treatment. So that's why we say time is brain. When we have someone that comes with an acute ischemic stroke, 
time is of the essence. We work very, very rapidly to try and get that patient treated if we can. For every 30 minutes delay in reperfusion or opening up that artery, the probability of that patient having a good outcome is reduced by 10%. So again, very, very time-sensitive treatments that we have when we see patients with stroke related to reduced blood flow. So when we see patients that come in with these kinds of strokes, we use a scale uh, to assess the severity of their stroke. So in the hospital, we use a, a stroke scale called NIHSS. That stands for National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale. It's a very complex scale calculated from 11 different components of neurologic function, and it's used to quantify the severity of stroke. So it goes from zero to 42 with zero being no symptoms at all. And then the more symptoms that you have, that number goes up. So really anything that gets, you know, past, you know, really past five or six, we are considered a moderate to severe stroke. And you can see some of the different components that we uh, test, facial droop, weakness in the arms. We uh, have patients uh, assess their ability to, to assess pictures, to assess language, to be able to read and recognize objects and things like that. And we do this very, very quickly. So the neurologist or ED team in our, in our ERs do this within minutes to get a very comprehensive assessment of, of uh, stroke severity. You don't have to do that. Out in the field, you know, you have probably all heard of FAST for stroke or BFAST. So how do you spot a stroke? This is for anybody. B is for balance. So loss of balance, dizziness can be a sign of stroke. So not everyone with dizziness has a stroke, but it can be a sign of a stroke. Eye function. So blurred vision is a very generic symptom, but when the eyes uh, shift one way or the other, we call that gaze deviation can be a sign of a stroke. Blurred vision can be a sign of a stroke. Double vision can be a sign of a stroke. So acute onset of vision change is something to be concerned about. F is for face, so facial droop. A is for arm, so arm or leg weakness. <clears throat> S is for speech, so slurred speech, inability to speak, or even inability to understand. So you start talking to someone and they don't understand you all of a sudden where like all of the, their language function is affected can be a sign of a stroke. And T is for time, time to call 911. Don't waste time, call an ambulance. So that's what B fast uh, stands for. And that's how you can try to help uh, assess a stroke for, uh, for anybody. What are the treatment options for a stroke? Unfortunately, some patients come in and there's not much we can do except just do med what we call medical management stabilize them, check their vital signs, and uh, do the things that we need to do to try and prevent a, a, another stroke. But for patients that get in very quickly, they may fall into some treatment uh, uh, categories. So one is what we call IV thrombolytic. So we used to uh, use a drug called TPA or Altaplace. Recently at Christiana, we switched to a different drug called TNK or tenecteplase. It's a newer generation drug but it's designed to break up the clot. So it's an IV medication that's typically given in the ER or while the patient's in the CAT scanner um, to, get, to break up the clot if we think they're having a stroke. Typically that's done for patients that are within four and a half hours from when we knew that they were last at their baseline or last, what we call last known well or last known normal. Meaning once a patient falls out of that time window, they may not be a candidate. Now there are some protocols at some centers where you can give it beyond that four and a half hour time frame, but that's why it's a very time sensitive treatment. It's, stroke is not something you want to sit on and wait and see if a symptom gets better because it it, it is you know very much time limited and time sensitive in terms of the treatments we have and recovery as well. Now, IV thrombolytics are very good, but they're not very effective for larger clots or larger blockages. So for some of these patients, they go right onto a procedure called mechanical thrombectomy, which is what we do as neurointerventionalists. And that's endovascular removal of the clot. So going through the artery, through the uh, catheters to try and get that clot out. So we do that through a variety of different tools that we have. One category is called aspiration. So through this, the catheters that I showed you pictures of earlier, we can deliver a catheter directly to the blockage or the clot. Here in this picture, here uh, you can see an open area in the artery. This uh, dark thing here is blood clot that's blocking the artery. So under our X-ray machines, we can take up a catheter right to the clot. On the back end, we hook up tubing that goes to a pump. So we turn the pump on and we do uh, aspiration. So the pump is continually creating a vacuum and sucking through the tubing that's delivered right to the clot. And we hope that we can get that clot sucked through the catheter and remove it that way. So that's called aspiration. Another type of device we use is called a stent retriever. So I showed you a picture of a stent that we sometimes use for aneurysms. A stent retriever is basically a stent that's attached to a wire on one end. So we can take again, a catheter to the clot, 
open up that stent retriever across the clot. We leave that open for a few minutes, hope that that clot gets integrated into the stent, and then we can pull that clot out through with the, with the catheter and that wire. So that's called a stent retriever. And when we do that, usually we're also doing aspiration, where we're aspirating through a bigger catheter down lower to try and suck everything in as we go. So those are the main devices we use for stroke patients. So here's a, a case. This is a 65 year old gentleman. His last seen normal was seven and a half hours ago. So this he's beyond the time window that we can give the IV clot busting drug. So he doesn't have that as a treatment option. His NIH stroke test score is 23. So again, on that scale, this is a very severe stroke. He has what we call global aphasia. Aphasia is inability to speak and Global aphasia means also inability to understand speech. So not only can he not get any words out, he can't even understand what you're telling him. So that's global aphasia. He has right-sided weakness, so he can't move the right side of his body. And he has what we call left gaze deviations. The eyes are looking over to the left. So if you remember that B fast for the eyes, the eyes are looking over to one side, he has weakness on the other side, and he has speech issues. So very much uh, 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 presenting with symptoms of an acute stroke. And this is a very severe one. So on his CAT scan, this is a CTA, which is a CAT scan with dye looking specifically at the arteries. The right, this is, the, uh, so on the left side of the screen is actually the patient's right uh, side of the brain. So this is what it should look like. You can see that this is the carotid artery. You can see that dye coming out and branching out. You look where the arrow is, this artery comes up and it stops right here, all right? You see that cutoff that should continue. So that's where the clot was. We have a specialized kind of scan on, under CAT scan that we call CT perfusion. That's what CTP stands for. So in addition to giving us a picture of the brain tissue, a picture of the blood vessels, CT perfusion is very cool technology that allows us to see what we call more physiologic brain function. So on this particular picture, you guys see that bright green on the left side of the brain. That's showing us the amount of brain tissue that's potentially at risk of dying if we don't open up that clot. Now, the pictures on this side of the screen, you don't see any color. Actually, you see a little bit of color. See that little bit of pink there? That's actually showing us the amount of tissue that's actually irreversibly damaged already. We call that the core infarct. So this is the amount of tissue that's already dead from the stroke. That happens within minutes. This is the amount of tissue that could be saved. We can get that artery open very quickly. So that's what CT perfusion imaging does. And we can, we can actually have access to that imaging on our cell phones. This is a very advanced technology. So within minutes of the scan, we can look at our cell phone, look at this imaging and make a split decision when the patient's still in the CT scanner, if we're gonna take them up to the uh, procedure room to do the intervention. And this one we did. So I did say that we were gonna do the intervention. The angiogram confirmed that there was a blockage. You could see where the arrow is. There's no blood vessel filling here that there should be. This is MCA's middle cerebral artery on the left side was blocked. After the procedure, you can see the arrow where the clot is now out, the arteries filling all of these vessels on the left side of the brain. And so this was a successful mechanical thrombectomy procedure. I went through the wrist, the radial artery. So from the time I got into the artery to the time this was open was 14 minutes. So these often are very, very fast procedures. His NIH stroke score was zero, meaning by the time he went home, he went from a very severe stroke, unable to speak, not able to move the right side, to no deficits at all by the time he went home. And you can see on the, this is an MRI scan. The MRI scan, the bright areas show, are showing us the areas that were ultimately affected by the stroke. So you can see compared to the tissue that could have been affected, that we were able to minimize the extent of brain tissue injury to the point where he had no deficits whatsoever. He was completely normal when he went home. So these procedures have really evolved over the last decade. Um, We've been doing them for many, many years, but the, the procedures have gotten much, much better because the tools have gotten better and we're able to do them much, much faster. You can see here, on average, our procedures are less than 30 minutes long when we do these. So we can really have a huge impact. Before we were able to do these successfully, this patient more than likely would have been left bedridden, debilitated, and needing daily care for everything uh, to being able to walk out of the hospital and go home with no deficits at all. So these are really our rewarding procedures when we can get these done quickly. This is actually the clot. So you can see the clot, the curve of it was sitting right there in that artery. And that's what came out through my, this was aspiration. So that was what got sucked out through the catheter with the aspiration. 
Here's a different uh, patient. This is a, a, a case that I use a stent retriever. This patient, this is a CAT scan, a CTA with the dye, and where the arrow was is showing a cutoff of the right middle cerebral artery. So he had a, what we call an M1 trunk occlusion, very big blockage. He also had a severe stroke of 15 uh, deficits, meaning he couldn't move his left side uh, was the biggest issue that he was having. The androgram again confirmed that the blockage was there in the right middle cerebral artery. Here's uh, with the stent retriever deployed under our x-ray machine. The dots here are the distal part of that beyond the occlusion. This is part of our wire that we've delivered it through. The microcatheter is the little catheter that we deliver it through. That's where the tip of that is. So that's what it looks like under x-ray with that stent retriever deployed. Now, as soon as we open that up, before we even pull it out, when we take a picture, oftentimes we can see flow through there. The reason that is that stent retrievers have actually pushed down on the clot to create a little channel of flow. So we leave this open for a few minutes, let that clot really get integrated into the stent. We pull it out, and afterwards the clot is out, flow has been restored. That's actually the clot here that was stuck to the stent retriever when we pulled it out. This patient was in a severe stroke when he came in. His stroke skill severity went down to a two, so minimal deficits at uh, one day within 24 hours after the procedure. On his follow-up CAT scan, there was no evidence of any major stroke on the CAT scan. So we really were able to salvage a large portion of his brain and function uh, from the procedure. So let me wrap up there in summary. Uh, neurodimensional surgery encompasses endovascular procedures of the brain and spine, as well as a variety of other additional minimally invasive image-guided procedures of the spine, as well as the head and neck. Uh, we do a, a breadth of procedures of different types. Much of the work we do revolves around treating vascular diseases of the brain, such as strokes and brain aneurysms, which are the bulk of what we do, like we showed, uh, I showed some cases today. So even though the schooling and training to become a neurodimensional surgeon is, is a lengthy process, the results are extremely rewarding. So uh, something uh, to think about if you're interested to, to, to pursue that. So I can, I think we have a time for a few more questions. I'm going to turn the lights on. It got dark here. So hang on one second and I'll be right back. Sure. All right. So it looks like there's- so, a Thank you. Fascinating. If I had it all to, to do again, I think it would probably follow in your footsteps. I've got a a question. Hardly a day goes by where we're not hearing about AI and machine learning and chat GPT. And what do you see the future looking like with AI and virtually assisted uh, surgeries, even beyond what we've got now? That's a great question. Actually, I was I, you know, I was thinking about that question about any like, re, uh, advancements in the field and you know what would I like to see as kind of the next evolution of our field. And that is actually in line with that. So there is, um, so part of that imaging I showed you with the, the perfusion imaging with the colors that shows us like what part of the brain's affected, what's not, that is, uh, we do consider that AI imaging and radiology for the imaging part of the stroke evaluation. So that has been a huge advancement in our field. Before we had that availability, um, we would have to, for example, to be able to look at that kind of imaging, we'd have to get to a, a computer workstation, have access to a PAX radiology workstation, log in and do all of those things. So now as a neurodimensionalist at Christiana, we are an extremely busy stroke center and we do a lot of these thrombectomy procedures. That technology to be able to look at a phone and have that information almost simultaneously from the time the imaging is completed is huge. The other huge advancement there is we are also a referral center for these uh, patients throughout the state of Delaware. We're the only center in Delaware that does this right now, and also some referring hospitals outside the state. So many of those centers also have the same technology. So for example, a patient that's at a hospital down in Sussex County, like Nanticoke, Title Health Nanticoke, or Bay Health in Dover or in Milford, if they have a stroke and they have this imaging done, I can have that imaging on my phone in my hand within minutes of when they're having that imaging done. So that allows us to communicate with the physician in a hospital one or two hours away within minutes of the imaging to make a treatment decision and get them here as fast as possible. Before that, we would have to wait for that imaging to get done, have it pushed through our normal radiology pathways, wait for that imaging to show up in our scanner, and often that would create delays in, in treatment and decision making. So that, that is one huge advancement. There's been advancements in stroke recovery with things like virtual reality, 
for stroke rehab, which I think is going to be promising moving forward. But one of the biggest things that I think is going to be huge in our field is the robotics. You've probably all heard of robotics in the field of surgery, where surgeons can do robotic surgery for different things. That is in the early stages of evolution for neurointerventional surgery, but it is out there. So some of the procedures have, all, have been done on the cardiology side, um, where they've done cardiac catheterization procedures robotically. Um, there have been some pilot studies done of doing those types of procedures for brain work. So for the, uh, the brain aneurysm treatment and things like that. Uh, and it's very promising. I, I would hope that over the next decade or so, um, not next year, not the next two years, but over the next maybe one to two decades, that will help provide or allow access to care to a larger proportion of patients that may not have, have that access now. Because we do run into that problem where a patient shows up in a hospital an hour or two away that doesn't have a neurodimensional surgeon but can use a procedure. It's often a challenge getting that patient transported in very quickly to our facility. A lot of our hospitals have bed capacity issues where we don't have the resources to even accept the patient. So technology like that would allow me or someone like me in a, in a, a bigger center to have remote access to be able to perform those procedures remotely at another hospital. And that can really expand care to rural areas, uh, uh, areas where we don't have easy access to patients or where we can't uh, transfer a patient due to accessibility issues or things like that. I think that's one area I would really like to see the field grow. And uh, we'll, um, I think we'll start to take hold in our, our specialty over the next one to two decades. Another thing I, I didn't really touch on here is there's a, a, a type of ambulance out there for stroke called a mobile stroke unit. So it's basically an ambulance that has a CAT scanner on the ambulance and has uh, the capability of a neurologist to video in and see the patient. So that actually allows, so instead of an ambulance going to pick a patient up, driving to a hospital, however far that is away, then assessing the patient, then getting a CAT scan, and then giving the IV clot busting drug, on these mobile stroke units, they can put the patient on the scanner in the ambulance. A neurologist can call into the ambulance when they're at the patient's house while they're, you know, while they're driving in, get the CAT scan, assess the patient, and give that medication in the ambulance en route to the hospital. So that will really streamline the ability to give the medication closer, you know, earlier to the time of the stroke. And would also help guide the patients that might need these thrombectomy procedures directly to a, a facility that can offer it, as opposed to going to the closest hospital, getting the evaluation, and then having to get transferred again to get these procedures done. We are at, we've at, you know talked about getting one for the state of Delaware to improve access to care here. We don't have one in Delaware. Uh, Philly area has one. There are some bigger metropolitan areas that have one. Uh, but I do think it can really have an impact, especially in, in um, Southern Delaware, where it, it's uh, more difficult access to getting these types of procedures done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, I can start going through some of these other questions here. How does your work-life balance look? How many nights per week do you have to work a night shift? <laughs> Not great, but I would say, you know, when I came to Christiana in 2014, about you know a little over eight years ago, at that time we were doing maybe maybe a hundred of these stroke intervention procedures. And our when we're on call, that's really our biggest burden, our biggest impact. Because when we get that call, our entire team has to be in the hospital starting that procedure within 30 minutes. So that's probably for us the most stressful part of the job is being on call, being you know rushing in to do these procedures in the middle of the night. Um, we were probably doing you know less than a hundred of them when I first came here. Over the past several years, that has exploded. To, uh, right now, we're doing over 200, on pace to do over 250 or 260. The last week I was on call, I believe I did 10 of these just myself. Um, and my t entire team did fit over 15, I believe. So that is a huge impact. Um, the, the nice thing, though, is that we do have four of us in my group. So we do rotate call one in four. So it, it, over the course of a month, just average one in four. So the other, you know, three out of four nights that we're not on call, we do have to try and find that balance. Um, but that is a good question. It is a very much um, a very subspecialized surgical type of field where there are emergent procedures. So um, it is a field that you do have to be uh, prepared, prepared for that lifestyle. Uh, is the risk of vasospasm the reason you generally don't give medication to treat high blood pressure after a stroke? Yes. It, it, so um, I want to clarify. So the vasospasm generally happens after 
uh, ruptured brain aneurysm, which is hemorrhagic stroke. So when we have a patient with a ruptured brain aneurysm that comes in, we actually do want to control their blood pressure because if, if the aneurysm hasn't been treated yet and it's ruptured, high blood pressure can contribute to, the, to that bleeding again. So when we get patients come in with bleeding, we do tend to control the blood pressure to try and minimize the risk of that bleed progressing or having another bleed. Now, if a patient goes into vasospasm after a ruptured brain aneurysm has been treated, then we can allow the blood pressure to go up to increase that blood flow to the brain for treatment of the vasospasm. Vasospasm typically is not something we see with the most common kind of stroke, which is ischemic stroke related to blockage of an artery. So when we have someone come in with ischemic stroke and we think there's blockage of an artery causing reduced blood flow to the brain, like a blood clot, we do want that blood pressure to stay high. If we drop the blood pressure, the brain's ability to continue to provide blood flow is gonna get even more reduced and risk the, uh, increase the risk of that stroke getting bigger more quickly. So that is why we don't give blood pressure medicine typically to a patient that comes in with what we call ischemic stroke from a blockage in the artery because the patient, need, the, the reason the blood pressure has elevated is to continue to pump blood up around that blockage to kind of maintain that blood flow to the brain. Uh, next question is, what is the largest amount of CSF you needed to remove? How is the reg how is that regulated since the intracranial pressure must be maintained within a small window? Good question. So we do have to balance what the pressure is in the head with the amount of fluid we're draining. So we do target the amount of drainage to what the pressure is uh, in the head. So when we have these uh, ventricular cat drainage catheters in the head, we do have to track what the pressure is to maintain it within that narrow range. So based on how high the pressure is, it does affect the degree of drainage, meaning if the pressure is very, very high, we have a lot of room to go, then we more aggressively drain fluid till we get it down into the range that we want. And once, once we have it drain in that range, then the degree of drainage goes down to maintain it in that range. So it is very, it's a nuanced uh, thing. The nurses in our neurocritical care unit are very, well trained to, to track that very closely. And we do adjust the amount of a, 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 a drainage <clears throat> based on the amount of fluid coming out and the, uh, the, the pressure that we're uh, um, checking. So that is a continually monitored thing that is tailored uh, based on what the pressure is and how much fluid is coming out. How long do the scans and the dye thing take? If it takes too long, wouldn't that risk the patient's life? Uh, it depends on what we're talking about here. So just doing an angiogram where we put a catheter in to take pictures, to do more or less a diagnostic test to get pictures of an aneurysm or something like that. That procedure, honestly, once I get started, it's probably not more than about 30 minutes, patients in the room about an hour. Now, the life-threatening things we're talking about, say a patient has a ruptured brain aneurysm, um, that's not something we always emergently have to treat, with, say within an hour of the patient coming in. We do wanna stabilize the patients. We want to treat them sooner than later, but those treatment procedures you know, range in time, you know, on average, maybe one to two hours, typically about an hour to an hour and a half. So the treatment procedures, uh, that's about the time that it takes. Now, when an aneurysm ruptures, there is not continuous bleeding from the aneurysm until it's treated. If that were to happen, the patient would not survive. When a brain aneurysm ruptures, it ruptures, typically it forms a clot to seal off where it ruptured from. So if this is the aneurysm, if, if it leaked out from the top, then it forms a clot to seal off that hole. That's why patients can even survive to get to the hospital. So we do have some time to get that aneurysm treated. It's unknown, you know, that risk of re-bleeding is there, but it's not something we have to, uh, for example, only have like an hour to go in and treat. So once an aneurysm is ruptured, we try to get it treated usually within the first 24, 48 hours because that risk is cumulatively higher on the, until we get it treated. Now, with a, a ischemic stroke, which is a stroke related to blockage of an artery, that's where we say time is brain, because for every minute that artery is blocked, brain cells are dying. So anytime we have a patient that come in, comes in with an ischemic stroke, time is of the essence. So for example, at Christiana Hospital, we talk about doing these scans. There are time metrics. There's goals based on what we set for ourselves and also what our uh, governing agencies, for example, the American Heart and Stroke Association have guidelines, the Joint Commission that accredits our hospital and all hospitals has guidelines. So we, based on those guidelines, we have certain thresholds that we, we have to meet, and then we are even more stringent on ourselves at Christiana. So for example, for a patient that comes into the hospital with an acute ischemic stroke, 
they have to get a CAT scan within 10 to 15 minutes. That, that, that is a guideline. So all of these patients get assessed very quickly in the ER and they go to CAT scan right away. That's, that's just standard routine practice. <clears throat> For the IV clot busting drug, that uh, the TNK that I was talking about, that should be given as soon as possible. Our average times at Christiana are less than 30 minutes, about 30 minutes or so. In general, for all hospitals, the, 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 you know, the metrics say you should give that within an hour of that patient arriving within the hospital, and the, sh the shorter the time, the better. So, for example, the American Heart Association sets guidelines at 60 minutes, 45 minutes, and 30 minutes as different levels of benchmarks that we try to meet, with 30 minutes right now being the most stringent. And we, in general, at Christiana, do a very good job of getting that in within 30 minutes for most patients. Now, for the treatment for the thrombectomy procedure, where we go in and remove the clot, we make that decision usually within 30 minutes of that patient being at the hospital, and usually we're in, in the head within 30 minutes, and usually, I mean, within an hour of the patient being in the hospital, and those procedures on average are done within 30 minutes of us starting. So again, there's metrics that are set forth by the American Heart and Stroke Association and the Joint Commission that very closely follow how hospitals do these procedures because time is of the essence. And I will tell you, we do these very, very quickly at Christiana. When you look at national benchmarks, things move extremely quickly once a patient comes in with a stroke when we're, we're trying to treat these types of patients. Um, what is the most strange case you have treated? Uh, that's an interesting question. Let me think about that. I'll go to the next one. What transportation by aviation have any effect? Would transportation by aviation have an effect due to a change in altitude or are they usually ground transported? So that's a good question for stroke patients with blockages of artery, what we call ischemic stroke patients. We do want to fly them here if we can, because it gets them here faster because these are, again, very time sensitive uh, treatments. The altitudes at which they come here on a helicopter are not enough to alter brain flow, brain uh, uh, perfusion and things like that. So we do not worry about that. So for any patient that say at a, some other outside hospital with a stroke that can, you, that can uh, get treated by one of these thrombectomy procedures, on days that we can fly, again, it's what it is very much weather dependent. We do want to fly them now. With a ruptured brain aneurysm, um, again, at the altitudes that the helicopters are flying, I don't think it's going to affect it enough to 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 do uh, to make any uh, effect on that. Higher altitudes, it, it potentially could. Now, we really, honestly, for unruptured brain aneurysms or treated brain aneurysms, I don't generally give restrictions on flying for patients on commercial aircrafts, because it is, you know, the barometric pressures are controlled inside of the aircraft. Um, so it's a little bit different than, say, if you're skydiving out in the open air at a high altitude. Uh, yes, that's going to make a huge difference. But in um, a, a barometric pressure controlled environment like a, an airplane, it shouldn't really have a huge impact. And doctor, if I could uh, get you to, to restate one thing, since sure. we have a lot of uh, middle and junior and high school students, uh, reflecting back on your own youth, when did you get interested in, in medicine and, and what course uh, instruction would you recommend? What should people be taking? Uh, great question. So I, I was always interested in science and medicine. I think even from probably honestly, like from junior high, high school, I, I almost felt like I, I wanted to go into medicine or something in the sciences. Um, and I even back in high school, remember, had an interest in the brain and in neurosciences that that early. Um, I, my father passed away at a young age. So I think that also propelled me to, to have an interest in medicine. Um, but I would very much encourage you to have a broad scope of, or a broad perspective when you are early on in your education. Don't try to, to narrow yourself down too, too early because you might be surprised at what you find uh, that you, you are interested in. So for example, high school, you're pretty much going to have a set curriculum and they're, you're going to have a set curriculum that's going to help you get into college. Once you're in college, I would encourage you to, to have a broad education. Now, there are some um, combined programs that can combine, for example, early admission into medical school where they can shave off a year and things like that. What you lose in doing that is that you may not get the opportunity to take a broader uh, 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 course load when you're in college, and you may not have that opportunity as, as easily when you go back. So I actually did a Bachelor of Arts as opposed to a Bachelor of Science. I did take uh, for example, I was a music minor in uh, when I was an undergrad. So I encourage you to have a broad 
um, uh, approach to your education early on, you do want, you're going to have to uh, take a, a, the, the core curriculum for pre-med. That's, that's, that's a given. You're, you, there's a minimum requirement for that. In addition to that, um, it, I, you know, medical school is challenging to get into. So you do want to have a broad perspective, a broad uh, approach to your education, but also show your dedication to the medical field. So you are probably going to have to do things like a lot of people do things like research projects, um, uh, community service, volunteering in hospitals or things like that, I think are important. Um, one of my jobs, for example, before medical school was I was an orderly in a, uh, in a surgery suite in a hospital. So I pushed patients around, transported them, cleaned, mopped up OR rooms and things like that. So it gave me, I think, a different viewpoint of medicine from the, you know, uh, uh, the, the non-physician side. Um, but it, it further just affirm my, my desire to do medicine. So I, I would try to put yourself in positions that gives you a broad exposure to the medical field, um, but also broad exposure to life in general, because you never know how your um, early education may impact your career later on. And once you get down the medical training path, it just gets busy. Um, it, it, like You always feel like, I'm going to get through this and it's going to get easier. To me, I just feel like it just gets busier and busier and there's just more and more you have to do. So you don't often have an opportunity to go back and do things that you uh, did. For, for example, I was in a, a lot of different things. I was into music. I was I, I One of my hobbies is horseback riding. So I did actually take some time off between college and medical school. I worked for a horse trainer. Um, so I actually did that for a while. I did a lot of different things. So I encourage you to take the opportunities early on to do that. So you know what your priorities are going to be as you uh, go uh, through your medical training, because time gets tighter and tighter to do those things as you progress. Um, and then, like I said, once you get into medical school, keep an open mind. So even though I like the neurosciences, once I found myself when I was in medical school, there were probably about five different uh, specialties that I thought I might like. Anything ranging from emergency medicine to neurosurgery to neuro neurology, emergency medicine, radiology. I almost felt like every rotation I went, I loved it. And I was like, man, I can see myself doing this. So just really keep a broad approach because regardless of what you end up doing, all of the things that you learn and experience as you get there will help you with some patient at some point, regardless of what you do. So I really encourage you to keep kind of that open mind. Don't pigeon your, like, don't, for example, you might know in high school, I want to do cardiology or I want to do pediatrics or I want to do OB or something. Keep that in the back of your head and, and work towards that, but don't rule anything else out because you might be surprised that what you might in, in, like in, enjoy um, as you go through your different rotations in, in med school and things like that. Thank you so much, Dr. Sivapatham. That was a great, great um topic. It was a great presentation. I kept seeing things in the chat that said it was great. Tim and I were texting back and forth saying, this is amazing. Um, we really, really appreciate you coming. Um, and everybody has said that. So thank you so much. Um, we, we may have to tap you again because this was fantastic. Um, yeah, glad you liked it. Everybody else, uh, Dr. Sivapatham's presentation will be available on DelawareMinimed.org in a few days. Uh, well, as along with his PowerPoint. Um, we will see you all next week for our final mini med of the season about dentistry and oral facial, oral maxillofacial surgery. So have a good night. Make sure you filled out that survey before nine o'clock and we will see you next week. Thanks everyone. Thank you, doctor. Have bye -bye. Great night. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye.